All right. Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Tim Johnson. I'm the Cultural Affairs Officer at the U.S. Embassy here in Canberra. Today, we're very pleased to host two distinguished speakers for this edition of Diplomacy Delivered on Human Rights. And the conversation today is an important one for both the United States and Australia. And the United States is grateful for Australia's leadership on this issue. Just yesterday, Foreign Minister Maurice Payne delivered remarks to the UN Human Rights Council calling for more to be done to address repressive measures against the Uyghurs and other minorities in Xinjiang. The US government has also consistently spoken out against the ongoing campaign of repression in Xinjiang, and we're also taking concrete action to target those responsible. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. Uh, while this program is supported by the US Embassy, I should underscore that the views of our speakers today are their own and do not necessarily represent those of the United States government. Today's session is also taking place under the Chatham House rule. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the many US government exchange alumni in attendance for this session. And uh, I'd like to give a special thanks to Jennifer Phillips of the State Department and for the Mission Australia team for their work to make this, this program possible. It's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Elaine Pearson. Elaine is the Australia Director at Human Rights Watch based in Sydney. Uh, she established the Human Rights Watch Australia office in 2013 and works to influence Australian foreign and domestic policies to give them a human rights dimension. From 2007 to 2012, Elaine was the Deputy Director of HRW's Asia Division in New York. Prior to joining Human Rights Watch, she worked for the UN and various NGOs in Bangkok, Hong Kong, Kathmandu, and London. She's an adjunct lecturer in law at the University of New South Wales and holds degrees in law and arts from Murdoch University and a master's in public policy from Princeton University. So I'll now turn it over to Elaine to introduce Kuzat Altai, and I hope you all enjoy the program today. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks so much to the US Embassy for kindly inviting me to moderate this event. Uh, Human Rights Watch Australia acts in association with Human Rights Watch uh, Incorporated internationally, and Human Rights Watch is an independent non-government organization. We are dedicated to protecting the rights of people around the world. And with respect to the topic today, in terms of human rights of, of the Uyghurs, we have actually been working on those issues in China for the past 25 years. So it's my pleasure today to introduce our main speaker, Kuzat Altai, um, who is the president of the Uyghur American Association. This is a nonprofit organization that works to promote human rights and democracy for Uyghurs, as well as to promote Uyghur culture worldwide. In 2018, Altai's father was forcibly disappeared in Urumqi. Um, now, Kuzat dedicates his time and resources to training the public and policymakers on the plight of Uyghurs. Altai is also the founder and CEO of Cybertech, a technology company. So Kuzat, I'd like to hand over to you now, maybe to speak uh, for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll have a, a Q&A. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Elaine. Uh, thank you for joining uh, for those guests. Uh, I cannot see you, but I can feel you. Thanks for joining. I think you care about uh, this cause and humanity. Thanks for your time. So uh, you said uh, you introduced me as uh, the president of Uyghur American Association. And I think I'm here rather than the, the president of UAA. I think I would rather be here as a son. Uh, I started this journey to save my father's life. And uh, that's how I started. Today still, I struggle, I suffer the, the, the family issues that I am having because of Chinese government that they're actually kidnapping my father still. Uh, there are giving us as a family psychological torture and physical torture. So I want to a little bit talk about the background of how I end up in today's situation. Uh, I grew up in uh, Urumqi, which is the capital city of uh, East Turkestan, AKA uh, Xinjiang. Xinjiang itself is a, is a word, if you translate it to English, it's a new region or new territory. So in 1884, China has occupied our land. Before that, we had maybe less than 1% of Han uh, Chinese population. And since then, we are struggling for our freedom and our people's uh, you know, uh, happiness as well. So uh, I grew up in Urumqi. And uh, as a child, I remember I was walking to school. Uh, while walking to school every single day, imagine this traumatizing experience. As a kid, you're walking to school and you see that you have your people trying to survive. Uyghur people. 
Uh, Uyghur people, they don't have job opportunities. They don't have uh, other opportunities like Han Chinese. They can apply for a job. They can go study in school. So what they end up with, they sell things in the street. They sell t-shirt for five yuan in Chinese money, which is like less than $1. They sell fruits. They sell anything they could to survive. And as a kid, every single day, I see the Chinese police were chasing our people on the street, beating them, just try to survive. And these people, imagine, remember, they cannot apply for a job because simply, first of all, they don't speak Chinese. Second, there's a strict rule in our region that Uyghur people are discriminated, that they don't give us opportunity to work. So that was my experience. And growing up, it was, it was very difficult. So uh, when I was 18 years old, I graduated from high school in Urumqi. I got into uh, Xinjiang Medical University, and it was my first year. And in my first year, uh, I got arrested by Chinese intelligence in a school. And uh, they were asking my aunt, my aunt is one of the prominent uh, Uyghur activists. Her name is Rabia Kadir. I think because of her, I suffered a whole my high school because of like our family's political background that our family was isolated, eliminated by the community, always discriminated, always like watched by Chinese government. So now this thing in, in a college, I was not able to study and uh, the Chinese intelligence threatening me, they, they said that they're going to kill me basically. So I, I realized that there's no way that I can survive in China. And I decided to escape and uh, go to another country. And uh, thankfully, uh, when I was uh, 19 years old in 2005, with my aunt, she was helping me in the United States. But at that time, uh, I got visa from Turkish embassy. I was able to go to Turkey in 2005. Uh, in 2005 to 2008, I stayed in Turkey for around two, two and a half year. Uh, then uh, through United Nations Refugee Committee, I became refugee and came to United States in 2008 as a refugee. By that time, I mean, when I came to United States, I had my wife, my 10 month old baby. I didn't speak English. And I came to uh, where my aunt lives, which is Fairfax, uh, Virginia. So, uh, you know, because of my family's political background, because of my aunt's political background, me as a, as a student got punished in school. I, I basically, I wanted to stay away from politics. I wanted to stay away from this Uyghur Chinese, Uyghur China's Chinese government conflict. So for past 10 years, I was only focusing on building my American dream. So uh, I struggled financially here in the United States, but I worked hard. I started my business, uh, you know, in 2018, I started sending money to my father and because he was retired and he was not able to work. And, you know, our family was already in very extreme political pressure for there's no way he can make money. So I was sending him and I was super proud as a son. The first time I can enjoy being a son who can take care of his father. And, uh, you know, that was a beautiful time. I was like thinking that my life is, I turned my life around, you know, you know, you know, American dream, things like that. But one day, all of a sudden in 2008, February, 2018, he sent me a message from WeChat. He said, son, they're taking me. And I can hear that his voice was super nervous. And uh, initially I didn't know this was a concentration camp. I thought in China, it's very common that you go to political study uh, occasionally every year, every leader comes like, for example, Hu Jintao, Xi Jinping, they all come, come up with their, Jiang Zemin, they all come up with their own uh, political ideology and they force the entire nation, 1.4 billion people to learn their ideology themselves. So I thought this is one of them. Then what happened is I start seeing that people like me here and there start popping up. And I just realized everybody uh, in the United States that I know, their family, they, they got disconnected. They don't know where there's a family. So then I think uh, from satellite images, uh, you know, I, I think they, people were able to identify there were many, many massive concentration camps were built. And then uh, there were a couple survivors from concentration camp. They were able to escape to Kazakhstan. And through that Kazakhstan, this news came out. And then we figure out that, you know, imagine, imagine cities, uh, New York Times, Manhattan, right? Times Square. Imagine Times Square is empty. At some point, the cities in Urumqi, in Aksu, in Kashgar, the main city that Uyghurs live, those cities were vacant. People don't see each other in the street. That was how scary is that, right? So people were massively taken to the concentration camp. Now, uh, in, in the concentration camp, it was so massive. Some of them could be hold like 
10,000 to 30,000 people uh, in, in a massive camp. So uh, I think in one time, uh, I, I think around 2018 or 19, uh, Chinese uh, train station in, in Urumqi and in Aksu in Kuchar, they start selling train tickets. And what happened was, I think hundreds of thousands of Uyghurs were shipped in the inner city of China. And we don't know what happened to these people. I think the concentration camps were so full that they were not able to hold people anymore. So they start sending people to inner side of China and people are speculating this could be organ harvesting, it could be forced labor, it could be anything that we don't know. And we don't know what happened to this, those people. Now, China themselves as a government, they were actually promoting or they were proudly saying their peer program that they were sending every, to every Uyghur people that they could not take into the concentration camp. They were sending one Han Chinese person as a relative, so-called relatives, to pairing them together. Imagine, imagine, you know, the husband, the husband is taken to the concentration or father was taken to the concentration camp and you have wife and you have children left inside the house. And one Han Communist Party member will stay with that family, monitor them. Are they speaking their language? Are they living their religion? Are they eating halal food? What they're doing? Are they acting like a Chinese person, right? So they take note and report that to the main, uh, whatever the, the, the structure they have. So there were many rape cases in that, those houses because you know, like when fathers and you know, those adults were taken to the concentration camp, you have wife and daughters left and what do you think is gonna happen? So China actually for decades, they were implementing one child policy. We all know that. So in a Chinese culture, uh, when you have a daughter, like it's not, they don't consider generally that their generation is continuing. So what they do, they wanna have boys. Everyone wants to have boys in that times. So they, they check the babies when they're pregnant. If there's, it's a girl, they do abortion. They just kill the baby. So because of this practice or many, many years, for decades, there's a huge gender imbalance in China. I think around 60 million to 100 million, I don't know, clear number. Han Chinese man cannot find a girl to get married, right? So this become a golden opportunity for Chinese Communist Party to incentivize Uyghur girls to Han Communist Party member. They're calling Uyghur, uh, Han Chinese Communist Party member to serve in East Turkestan region loyally to China in reward. They were giving our girls to them. So what is the format? Imagine, you know, I think everybody seen those videos. If you Google a forced marriage in China, you will see that this Uyghur girl, girl, she's crying and she's getting married. So increasingly what's happening right now is Uyghur girls, 17 years old, 19 years old, 20 years old, they are proactively start filling out the application to say, I want to get married with a Han Chinese, possibly a Communist Party member. Why? It's their security for their family. I want to get married and release my father from the concentration camp, release my mom from the concentration camp. So this was what's happening for many years, like two years. So I started speaking up, organizing the community, start act uh, advocating for our people. In the beginning, it was very difficult. Even that when we say, when we say this word concentration camp, people were offended and they were saying, this is not possible, don't exaggerate. We were not exaggerating. There's nothing that we can compare in the recent history that one to three million people uh, in kept on those places. Now, my father was released after I became uh, president of Uyghur American Association. Uh, people wanted me to lead this organization because of my, my work that I did for in the past two years. And as soon as I, um, I became president of the Uyghur American Association, one day, one of our relatives all of a sudden sent text message like through WeChat to my brother's wife say Kuzat should stop what he's what like he's advocating work work against our government our government is good uh we are not happy with what he's doing if he's doing for his father let him know that his father is alive he's fine and i was so pissed i was so angry because now again for two years i didn't see my father every single night i cried for my father i see him i saw him in my dream dream my work was messed up i was not able to focus at work it was just so difficult that past two years, even I had relationship issues in, in the families, it was just an extremely difficult time. 
Now all of a sudden I received message saying that my father is alive. I didn't believe. Then after a month, they sent a picture of my father laying down in the bed, looking at the picture like a camera. And I was like, how do I know this is real? I just didn't believe in that, right? So, but unfortunately, let's, let's put it this way, fortunately, right? Uh, I think January, uh, Global Times, I think this is Chinese uh, state media, uh, they released a video of my father. And the first time in two years, I saw my father was alive. He was alive first time and is speaking on the Chinese TV. And he said, I am the father of Kuzad al Tai, the president of Uyghur American Association. Son, you need to stop what you're doing. I am very happy our government is taking care of us. And if you don't stop doing this, you, I don't have son like you. He was publicly denouncing me as a son the first time I saw him. Now, should I be happy or should I cry? Well, what, what should I do? Imagine that I struggled, I cried for my father. I didn't know he's alive or not for two years. All of a sudden, I see my father denouncing me on TV. I mean, it was extremely confusing situation, but I was grateful that my father was alive. Uh, he was released on, on January, right? But unfortunately, what happened is he was taking it when he was 67 years old. And uh, he stayed in very small place that would normally eight people or, or 10 people would leave. He said 70 people were there. The restroom was, was there. There's no doors. There's nothing. And people, because it was so small, people have to sleep on top of each other. There's no space. At night, you have to hold your thing because you cannot go to restroom. As soon as you go to restroom, what's gonna happen? Your spot is gone, there's no way you can sleep. It was so difficult. For every single day, the Chinese government forced them to sit on the concrete floor for 18 hours. There are, there are difficult, there's different ways of tortures, right? First of all, a psychological torture, putting people 18 hours that you cannot move, just sitting in there, it's extremely difficult. People are going crazy, right? And a physical torture, they were beating them, they were uh, you know, taking them out, beat them in the public, beat them in private, all these things, and cursing them all the time and making them memorize the Chinese Communist Party is God kind of thing, right? It's extremely difficult for him. So the thing is, I think he was a luckier one, right? Because his son was advocating for him. There were many, many people that they don't have relatives abroad. They don't have relatives that can, who can speak up for them. Many people died in the concentration camp. Even uh, Mirigul Turson, she was released from the concentration camp. She testified in US Congress. She said in, in three months, nine people, nine women died because of the difficulties, not out of torture, right? Because just it's very difficult to leave, lack of nutrition, lack of hygiene, physical, mental t torture, and raping the women in there. Nine ladies died in, 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 in the three months. So now I think, uh, I think I'm continuously speaking up for my father. However, I'm, I'm, I am getting pressure that to stop uh, doing what I'm doing. Uh, that is, uh, I think, instead of giving you really from the historical perspective or political analysis perspective, I'm really giving people an authentic experience that I had with my family. I don't, I don't think, uh, you know, speaking more than that is going to be, uh, I don't think I have more than enough knowledge than this. Yeah. Well, Kuzab, thank you so much for sharing that. And I mean, I think, you know, I've been working for an organization that has been covering these issues for a long time. But actually, when you hear the personal accounts of the impact and the toll that this has on families like yours, I mean, I think it just really brings home, you know, what, you know, massive atrocities, you know, are occurring right now um, over there. Um, I guess, you know, for the benefit of our audience, I just wanted to explain, I mean, Human Rights Watch has been working on these issues, you know, as I mentioned, for, for 25 years. We've looked at, you know, religious discrimination and persecution of the Uyghurs. We've looked at enforced disappearances, torture, um, but in the last few years, we've really ramped up that work. And in 2018, we put out um, our own report uh, documenting the mass arbitrary detention um, of more than a million, million uh, Uyghurs and other Muslims um, in the camps, but also documenting the way in which people outside the camps really are not free because of the massive surveillance state um, and because you spoke to, you know, the really um, spooky and problematic homestay program, which is something that we have also reported on in which Chinese authorities are actually staying 
in the homes of Uyghurs, you know, effectively to, to monitor and, and to, to spy on them. Um, we've also put out another report last year, which looked at, um, we basically reverse engineered um, an app that is used by police uh, in the Uyghur areas, um, really to monitor um, all sorts of, you know, behavior, um, the movements of people, who they are meeting with, um, you know, when they leave their home, if they're going to the, the mosque to, to pray. Um, and on the basis of the information that is collected uh, through this app, um, you know, decisions are made about whether to send someone, you know, in for interrogation, questioning, or whether to, you know, send them to, to the political re-education camps. So that's, I guess, the, the background in terms of what Human Rights Watch um, has been doing. I, I wanted to ask you a question, I guess, you know, in terms of your activities, you mentioned towards the end that you've also paid, um, you know, you've also paid a price for those activities in the United States. Can you talk a little bit about that? Has there been retaliation against you and other American Uyghurs? And I guess, how have you, yeah, how have you managed that? I, I think uh, in the United States, right, uh, Uyghurs are very safe. I don't think China can do anything other than uh, psychological torture, kidnapping our family back home, uh, you know, threatening us with our family. And there's no physical evidence that, you know, Uyghurs are in danger. However, uh, I have received that threat so through social media. People wanted to kill me, things like that. I didn't really take it serious uh, because I truly believe America is a safe place for Uyghur people. However, I was living in an apartment last year and uh, it was on the peak of my activism. And one day I came back, I see a mark on my door, which is like what I, what I can clearly see is a knife. Uh, somebody just, you know, put the mark on my door and uh, I asked apartment, there was no camera and it's not my apartment, it's not my building, I cannot put the camera. So I moved out, I, I moved out that house because of my family's safety and I put it like 360 degree uh, camera system in my house, now I feel safer. So, but however, People abroad, they're living in other states. For example, people living in Turkey, we were people. People living in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, people living in Australia, right? Let's, we can, I think, separate them to, to, to uh, people living in democracies. For example, Australia, Canada, United States, Germany, or Europe in general, we are pretty, pretty safe. But a Chinese retaliation is this, right? They are kidnapping our families. They're going to our house. And I know that when I was running an, another organization called Uyghur Entrepreneurs Network, it was before uh, Uyghur American Association, we had around 20 members, right? Uh, Chinese Communist Party members, uh, Chinese intelligence, like we call Enchenji, which is Chinese intelligence, uh, that they are uh, responsible for those kind of things. They went to our members' house, calling our uh, members, were sitting next to their mothers and saying, you need to leave, you need to stop, right? And they don't have to say, I'm going to kill your mother. But again, that's what we translated to, right? So that's the things they do. And also they forced our mem community members to spy on each other, right? So the, the, the common trick is they will call someone, they will say, you know what, I'm with your mom right now. And uh, first of all, don't speak up. If you're not speaking up, fantastic. I want to know ABC123. I think China already knows those information. They'll ask what they know already to test that person if they're loyal or not, and then step by step, putting these people in a spy position. But I think United States is doing a great job and FBI and local community, we had great training and uh, you know, helping people to understand when they face this kind of situation, what they can do to, uh, to report this kind of evidence to FBI. I think people are pretty comfortable here. Unfortunately, that we can, we can say that uh, people in Turkey probably uh, there were uh, an evidence that, uh, you know, we were women called Zinat Kultursun with her two baby were deported from Turkey uh, through Tajikistan to China. So th that is something that is extremely concerning because of uh, increasing uh, political and economical relationship between Turkey and China. But in the Western world, this is all China is doing is forcing Uyghurs to stop doing their activism at the same time, forcing them to spy on Uyghur community. If not, they are threatening to kill our family members or put them back to the concentration camp. And I know that has been a big concern here in Australia. Um, there was a new uh, foreign interference law that was passed quite recently, which actually makes it a crime to harass or intimidate 
Australians, um, but I also know that, you know, a lot of Uyghur Australians have felt under a lot of pressure um, and have been very worried about possible retaliation against family members um, back home. I guess in terms of activism, I mean, what would be your advice uh, to Uyghur Australians and Australian civil society organisations that are working on these issues? You know, what is your experience of what has been most effective um, in the US? I think in past two years, uh, I've learned something. I think Chinese governments, uh, despite their evil, despite how many people they kill, not only Uyghurs, it could be Hoi, it could be Chinese, it could be a Chinese Christian, it could be anyone who is not aligned with Chinese Communist Party member. Now recently we have seen those evidence very openly in Hong Kong, right? So I think despite that, Chinese Communist Party's legitimacy is coming from the strong economic growth of China, which is Chinese GDP. I think, you know, these kind of, uh, when we, uh, when governments, when NGOs, when uh, activists talking about we're so concerned about human rights. Those emotional things, China, they don't care. Chinese Communist Party is evil. They, they are not going to take any action for our concern or for our thoughts and prayers or for our protest on the street. Everything we do should directly hurt Chinese economy because Chinese government's legitimacy is coming from strong economic growth if we can stop their economy if they are going to pay the price in the dollar amount, they're going to force to start listening to the world. Otherwise, they will not listen to us. So what am I advocating is this, right? Imagine thousands of, we're talking about, uh, you know, Australian, this uh, organization, I forget their name. They come up with a report that 80,000 Uyghurs were working in those factories in inner China. And I know two of my cousins are working in those forced labor factories from Monday through th Saturday, 18 hours a week, they're producing things for free for the Chinese government. Why you cannot beat Chinese uh, you know, product made in China price? Because it's made with slave labor. And it's so complicated that we don't know what is coming from China is made in a concentration camp or it's made in a forced labor camp or it's made with legitimate for labor. We don't know, it's super complicated. Now that's, I think the things we can do is advocating for international companies like Adidas, like Volkswagen, like uh, H&M, Zara, anyone, one by one to ask them to practice human rights, to force their uh, logistic firms to sort, where are their cottons coming from, their labor's coming from, stop buying them. I think China is not safe place anymore. China's showing super aggression for being superpower, getting very aggressive, fighting with India, uh, things in Hong Kong, they're threatening Taiwan. There are going to be economic instability or political instability. I think it's for companies' benefit if we can, Uyghur people or around the activists can advocate to those companies to start moving out their factory from China, maybe for Philippines, maybe for Indonesia, maybe for other places. When they start losing money, they're going to listen. Now, in the United States, we have this um, after Uyghur human rights uh, uh, bill. Now, their second bill is coming. It's Uyghur, human, uh, Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. If this passes, we, US government is going to enforce very strict rule to bring in anything from China. As one of the biggest buyers for Made in China product, I think China is going to force to release our people from the concentration camp, from the forced labor camp. It will have direct and immediate impact in the people's life back home right now. If we stop buying Chinese product, start advocating made in China is made in concentration camp, forcing the Chinese government to listen to those people. Otherwise, I don't believe Chinese government will listen to thoughts and prayers and the political concerns of politicians. Thanks, Kuzat. And I mean, I think the forced labor issue has been getting a lot more attention, you know, certainly here in Australia, we've seen the recent developments in the US. And, you know, I think here in Australia, um, focusing particularly on the companies and asking companies to do their due diligence and, you know, to prove that there is no forced labour in their supply chain, you know, is absolutely something that we should be doing because, you know, it's not like um, these abuses that are going on in the Uyghur regions are not, you know, very well known. There has been a lot of media coverage. There's been the disclosure of, you know, Chinese Communist Party documents about exactly what is occurring. 
Um, but, you know, I agree that there is really an onus on companies um, to ensure that they are abiding by the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And that means doing their due diligence and also making those reports public. I guess, you know, I wanted, I can see some questions are coming through in the chat and I definitely want to, to get the, to those questions and to encourage, you know, our audience to, to submit questions. Um, but before I do so, I guess, you know, I wanted to touch on, I guess, these issues around, yeah, trade policy and I guess what we want governments to, to do. I think Human Rights Watch, you know, has long been critical of the US government, of the Australian government for really um, downplaying human rights um, because of the importance of the trade and economic relationship with China and doing that for many years. And now I guess one could argue, you know, given the, the trade war that the Trump administration, you know, has with China, you know, is it convenient now that human rights all of a sudden, you know, are, are being raised um, in this way? So I guess, you know, what more would you like to see from Western governments that now, you know, seem to be saying the right things on human rights issues? What kinds of actions would you like to see from, from those governments? Um, to, to address these issues? And is there a way in which they can work collectively on these issues, for instance, through the UN Human Rights Council? I think there's many things they can do. Unfortunately, for past two years that we've seen that uh, they did not do enough, but it doesn't mean that they cannot do in the future. Uh, uh, I believe that every minute that we didn't take action, just, just, just imagine, just close your eyes, just think about it. Every minute somebody was getting raped somebody was getting organ harvested, somebody was uh, in the forced labor, and somebody was getting killed. And every minute that happened for past two years, past three years. Now, uh, many people died already, but we can actually still save many people in the con still in the concentration camp or still not being yet taken to the concentration camp. I think governments should speak up, uh, learn from the United States, uh, actually work in legislation to have laws to protect the Uyghur, Kazakh, Kyrgyz minority or the minorities in China uh, in general and their human rights in general, Chinese Christians, Chinese Muslims, it doesn't matter. Anyone is not Chinese Communist Party member should be protected under Chinese Communist Party. I think they can start working on legislation like something like where we have in the United States that ha will have binding effect in that countries. If you pass a law, say, we're not going to buy, we're not going to allow the product that is in the made in concentration camp, that itself is better than, you know, we, we have concern about human rights because your concern is not going to save life. China is not going to listen to concern, number one. I think number two important thing is China is unfortunately doing really, I think they're very good at keeping those area encapsulated. Uh, my region uh, is Turkestan, our region. It's encapsulated area. It's an information black hole. None of the information is coming out, not, no information is going in. And it's very difficult for us to prove that there are people are getting raped and there's genocide. Now, I think United Nations, European parliaments, they can raise their voice. Imagine Chinese government, they're occasionally, they're making videos, uh, making Uyghurs are dancing, we're so happy. You know, Chinese government is so good, we love our party, things like that, right? If Uyghurs are so happy, as you mentioned, if those are re-education camp that you're teaching us how to have a skill to make money, why it's, it's something you should be proud of. Why are you hiding? Open your border, open the region for international journalists to freely go there. For example, ask my father. You told my father to go to TV by putting the gun on his head, asking him to say, son, I'm denouncing you. I love Chinese Communist Party. Why not? send somebody else to let my father really speak his voice. You know, international governments should force China to allow UN a special, for example, observers to go to, to special investigation in there if China is confident that there is no genocide. But China is not allowing. They are definitely hiding something. I think these are the things that governments can do. And most importantly, uh, the government, the Western governments should give Uyghur refugees asylum or, or bring Uyghur refugees to their nation. It's, it's, it's one of the most significant, most straightforward way to help Uyghurs, but the governments are not doing enough. For example, I know that in Thailand, in Kazakhstan, in Kyrgyzstan, in Turkey, probably in combination, there are 100,000 Uyghur refugees. 
and their life is not safe. We don't know what's going to happen because those countries are, have very good relations with China and their life could be in danger anytime. So if Australia, United States, Canada, or Europe start giving special visa status for Uyghur people, if we can save their life, imagine there, if there's 100,000 Uyghurs in Turkey, imagine half of them don't feel them themselves as, as don't consider themselves have safe environment. They're not able to speak up with their family. If we can bring them into United States, Australia, Canada, or Europe, now, first of all, they have a safe environment. They can, their life is going to be safe. Number two, now they can start speaking up for their parents, for their relatives. And then I think they can even save more lives. That is, uh, the governments can directly uh, do to, to save, uh, you know, Uyghur people's life by giving us asylum or refugee status. Thanks, Kazan. I think they're really important recommendations and quite practical things for governments to do. And I mean, I totally agree with you that I think one of the problems is just the completely, you know, denials of access um, to the Uyghur regions to understand exactly what is going on. And I mean, to that end, I guess the UN Human Rights Council opened this week. Uh, we heard already that uh, Australia's Foreign Minister, Maurice Payne, uh, spoke actually on Monday at the Human Rights Council and she actually mentioned in her statements uh, the restrictions uh, that, that Uyghurs and other minorities face in Xinjiang. Um, there has been some calls at the UN Human Rights Council by 50 um, or more special rapporteurs, basically UN experts, who have basically condemned the lack of access um, to China's Xinjiang regions um, and the, have also condemned human rights abuses in places like Tibet and Hong Kong. And those UN experts have been calling for an emergency special session on China at the UN. Now, this is something that has also been echoed by more than 300 civil society organizations who you know, issued a report, um, a, a letter last week calling on governments um, to have this special session with a view to setting up some kind of monitoring mechanism um, on the Chinese government, precisely because there isn't UN scrutiny. And I think this is something where, you know, it's, it's disappointing that, you know, the US government walked away from the Human Rights Council and, and left its seat because it was concerned about, you know, the selectivity and, you know, perceived bias, I guess, against Israel. But at the same time, you know, actually what we really need at the UN Human Rights Council um, is we need more scrutiny on the powerful countries that are managing to evade their responsibilities on human rights. So I guess, you know, I wanted to get your views on whether, you know, you think this kind of UN monitoring mechanism that, you know, many organizations have called for, you know, is something that, you know, our governments um, should, should be pressing for to, to make a reality, because for it to happen, you know, we actually need st states to, to speak up. I think, not sure this is a politically correct statement. However, I'm gonna speak from my heart. I think China has significant influence in the United Nations. And it, when I met, I went to Geneva, I went to New York to meet officials. I'm not gonna mention their name. They're all talking about how China has influence on, on United Nations as, as organizations. So it is very difficult to say anything against China in UN. However, this situation is getting escalated to something close to what happened in World War II. Like three million people are dying in the concentration camp. Finally, world is start accepting there's genocide. I think UN is acting because probably they can't, they see that there's undeniable fact that Uyghurs are subjected to genocide by Chinese Communist Party. It's better that they're speaking up right now. However, I think Nations like United States, Australia, Canada, Western nations, they should speak up even more to put more pressure on UN to send special rapporteurs or those people to China. However, something I've learned as a student in China is when I was a kid in, 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 in East Turkestan in Urumqi region, right? So imagine that their central government will send to audit those schools once in a while. We would know if the Chinese officials were coming to our school three months in advance. 
So we would prepare, memorize the things that we're going to say, you know, painting the walls, washing the streets, making it so rainbow sunshines that it's normally not like that. So a week before that, they will give us new uniform and you know what, the Chinese officials will come and they will see brand new school with brand new uniforms. Everybody's so happy. Everybody was so loyal to the Communist Party. China is extremely good for creating fake views like this. So how do we know? How can we ensure that when this observer is going to China, the Chinese government is not staging up a fake environment to show Uyghurs are so happy, only allow those observers to talk to so-called happy Uyghurs that was probably Chinese Communist Party members. How do we know that? So I think not only sending those observers, sending those observers to have freedom to talk to anyone and probably involving Uyghur organizations because we understand how China will play this game. So we will able to guide and help on, on those uh, circumstances to give probably more accurate information assessment of what's happening in the region. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And I think, um, I think it's actually very important and part of the reason why the UN Human Rights Office has not gone to Xinjiang region already is because they are insisting on, you know, the, the freedom to be able to speak to whom they choose and because they don't want to go on simply, you know, a stage managed propaganda visit. Um, but, you know, I do think it's, it's very important. I think you're right that the Chinese government has been very active in trying to undermine the UN system. And I think now is not the time actually to be walking away from the UN Human Rights Council, but actually we need um, governments that are committed and strong on human rights to be there to really sort of, you know, counteract um, those efforts that the Chinese government is making to try and undermine um, these, these institutions, which really are, you know, very important. And, you know, they were um, put in place, you know, certainly after the atrocities of World War II, because, you know, we didn't want to see those atrocities happening again. I want to now um, go to the questions from the chat, because I can see, you know, we have a lot of questions and I'd encourage people to, to post more questions. Um, you know, maybe I'll start, there was, you know, one here about um, following up on that issue of forced labor um, and saying that the onus is really on activists to raise awareness, but what should the government do to help ensure that there are legally enforcing, that they are legally enforcing, I guess, the standards on companies to, to clean up their supply chain. And I guess maybe just to give you a bit of context, here in Australia, we have a Modern Slavery Act, um, but unfortunately, you know, it doesn't have financial penalties on companies. So companies that have, you know, a turnover over a certain amount are required um, to submit disclosure statements, but if they don't do it, there's actually no penalty for, for not participating. So, yeah, I mean, I guess the question is, what should the government be doing to ensure there's more legally binding uh, standards on forced labor? I, I, I think, you know, I, I don't know how the Australian legislation will work. In the United States, we actually go to senators and congressmen and women to talk about these kind of issues. And we're as, asking for tangible impact. It's not concerns. It's not thoughts and prayers. It should be have a binding effect. That's why I think it's... Uh, we were uh, uh, forced labor prevention act uh, right now it's on motion i think people are uh, start supporting and we have more supporters uh, in both sides of aisle supporting this this law if this law is going to pass it is going to have binding effects right so i think uh, around the world may whether it's in, in the european parliament whether it's in uh, australia or canada we should directly talk to our representative to ask guidance what can we do and can we, what can we do to come up with the legislation or how can we support this thing to happen so the governments can actually stop uh, importing uh, goods from China or recently uh, what happened in the United States where I think it was 800 tons or something. I don't clearly remember what the human hairs, like it was harvested from Uyghur women's the fake hairs that they, you can put on, on top. It was, uh, you know, detained, I mean, they actually kept in the custom because they, they knew that those products was made probably in the concentration camp and that products were not allowed. Now they're having financial loss at least. Now it's gonna de-incentivize those manufacturers to use Uyghur forced labor. We just have to basically stop buying Chinese product if we can, 
maybe one less a day, one less a week, or one less a month, or say, in a, in a, in a month, this is the week that I dedicate my family to not buy anything made in China. Or every Friday or Monday, I don't buy made in China. Purposefully creating this, I think without having direct financial impact to Chinese government, they're not going to stop. They're not going to listen to the free world's concern on human rights. Another question for you, Kuzat. Um, what's your suggestion for um, Uyghur Australians to ensure their cyber security? to avoid potential retaliation? And what can the government do to protect vulnerable Uyghur Australians and their activism to, to help save their, their family members and friends um, in China? I, I, I need to admit that I'm not cybersecurity engineer or expert. However, uh, I have a WeChat on my phone. I bought a new phone and uh, just only for WeChat because I don't have TikTok on my phone. I don't have WeChat. I don't have any made in China uh, product on my that specific dedicated phone is dedicated to install WeChat to communicate in China. So it is uh, actually connected to VPN. So uh, if I log in, uh, my location is Frankfurt, right? And I have malware scan on my phone. So it will periodically check my phone if it's safe or not. That's the only thing I can do to protect my cybersecurity, I guess. And other than that, I don't really have a lot of information. However, in terms of security of people, and they're in general, for example, getting harassed by Chinese government. So I think we can learn from what we have been doing as your uh, uh, community here, working closely with the FBI. And the FBI has this, uh, you know, periodic uh, citizenship trainings. They can provide training to our community and uh, giving, giving us guidance how to protect ourselves, how to protect our rights. And when we face this kind of threat from Chinese government, what should we do, right? A lots of people in the community members, they don't necessarily know how to do that. I don't know what is equivalence in FBI in Australia. Maybe our community members can reach out to them and organize training, organize event together, so they can actually give uh, you know, advice, guidance for our uh, you know, Uyghur community members in those places. At the same time, I think speaking up is very important because people, they don't speak up. They don't, they don't mention, they, Sometimes they just feel like this is a normal thing. Oh, every Uyghurs are getting harassed. So, so what, right? No, we, everyone needs to speak up. The world needs to know. First of all, China hostage our family. They kidnap our family. Second, by kidnapping our family, they're threatening us to spy on our community. This is big. Everyone needs to speak up. I think this is something that we can do to create awareness. From there, I think after this couple of training events in Washington, D.C. area, we can see that it, it had a positive impact in our community. I think that's a very practical thing that, you know, that the government can do is, you know, provide that training on how people can communicate safely. And I think you're right to be very skeptical of, of Chinese apps, which, you know, obviously are in the news a lot lately. Um, there was another question um, actually about, um, you know, what is, Someone said, you know, a piece I read last week described what is happening to the Uyghurs as a genocide. Um, you know, do you agree with that? And if so, you know, what does that mean? You know, what needs to happen to, to protect Uyghurs? I mean, uh, as I mentioned, I'm not a, a specialist on this cause or political analyst, but I think genocide was going on for past 70 years. Chinese Communist Party killed more people that I believe than World War II in combined in the cultural revolution uh, since 1949, especially in our region, there were no mechanism to keep those data. If somebody disappear in a village, who do you, who do, 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 will keep their data? For example, I met a Chinese Communist Party, former Chinese Communist Party member in the United States. She was professor that was, she was specialized at teaching Chinese Communist Party history. And she said, that she knows in Tibet, Chinese Liberation Army were hunting Tibets on the mountain, like hunting animals. This happened in the 80s. Nobody knows. So genocide is going on in China right now. I mean, before, it's going on all the time. Millions of people are in the concentration camp. They are killing them, organ harvesting, and this forced sterilization, forced abortion from Uyghur women. Right? These are all genocide. If this is not genocide, what is genocide in 21st century? 
show me the second location this is happening in this kind of scale in the planet Earth, nowhere else except Chinese Communist, uh, under Chinese Communist Party's regime. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, from our perspective, I guess we are certainly having discussions about, we haven't actually made, you know, a determination yet as to whether it is genocide or crimes against humanity. Um, but that said, you know, these are legal determinations that, you know, it can take courts, you know, years or even decades um, to come to these determinations. We know right now um, the International Court of Justice is hearing a, a genocide uh, case uh, with regards to what is happening to you know, Rohingya Muslims in, in Myanmar. But I think, you know, regardless of what we call it, let's be clear, you know, this is mass arbitrary detention of more than a million people. This is a very serious human rights atrocity. And, you know, even if people are now being released, um, you know, sometimes from those camps, because of the very extensive surveillance system that is operational, you know, throughout the entire region, um, there really is, you know, no freedom, I would say, for, for Uyghurs or for other Muslims or for others, you know, who, who are living there. So this is a very oppressive um, situation. And I think, you know, we really need to look at, you know, what are, you know, the, the effective forms of, of pressure um, to address, you know, this, this situation. I'm just looking um, to see if there's, you know, some, some other questions. I think there has been, there wasn't one other question um, that we received earlier about, you know, why hasn't there been so much uh, condemnation about the abuses that Uyghur people are facing? And, you know, why have uh, Muslim countries not been speaking up on this issue? I think it's, you know, humans, right? When you say Holocaust, like, have you been Holocaust? When nobody lived in that, you know, probably the audience us, we have not witnessed that. But when you say Holocaust, we remember those pictures. We remember those piled up bodies on top of each other. We remember those, the picture of gas chambers, right? Picture is very important. Recently, right, those, uh, if you remember the turtle in the ocean, that she has the, the straw on her nose that itself created international movement to stop using plastic straw. The thing is right now, the problem that we have is Chinese go communist government is strictly controlling the region as an information black hole. It's very difficult for us to Uyghur people to prove, to have video evidence that Uyghurs are subjected to genocide by Chinese communist party. If you see what happened in Rohing Rohingya, right? There's videos people can see, right? If you know Hong Kong, people can see, unfortunately, mm -hmm. first of all, we just don't have enough information because China is emphasizing those areas. That's why we need to force United Nations, e European parliaments or international organizations to have special uh, rapporteurs to go there to, to observe the situation. That's number one. Number two is I believe the strong economic relationship with China and every single like I've been in many countries around the world uh, in the last two years to advocating for Uyghur people. I've talked to many politicians. And the first word is we have trade with China. We have economic relationship with China. We don't want to piss off China. We want to make sure. I think money is, is one of the biggest concern. That's what's happening. And that's number two. Number three, I believe, is unfortunately, these so-called Muslim nations are standing with China. I mean, not the people, however, the government, because the, I think most countries, they don't have a level of democracy that we have in the United States or in Australia. I think those regimes that they support each other, but they're actually not speaking up. Now the China is saying, you know what? Like Uyghurs are Muslim, Uyghurs are Turk, Turkic. Why Kazakhstan is not speaking up? Kazakhstan is not speaking up. Turkey is not speaking up. If there were genocide against Uyghurs, Turkey is the first nation should speak up because president or prime minister, whatever you call Recep Tayyip Erdogan, he spoke up for Arab Spring, he spoke up for Palestine, but he didn't speak up for Uyghurs. Therefore, even though he was Turk and Uyghurs are Turkic, means that there is no genocide. It is CIA, it's NSA, whatever. That is what's happening with the Muslim nations because they have strong economic relations and the like regime with each other in those Islamic nations that unfortunately, this is, this is very unfortunate. 
And I think Muslims around the world, scholars, imams, universities, whatever, in the Spanish investor nation, we need to communicate this information back to our home. If you're in the United States, if you're in Australia, if you are a scholar, speak this thing, this truth, to people in Egypt, to people in Saudi Arabia, to people in Turkey, whatever, we have to create awareness from the public and the, 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 the people should put pressure to their government to speak up. Yeah, I agree with you. And I mean, I think, I think it actually is really disappointing that we haven't seen, you know, stronger support coming from, you know, Muslim countries around the world on this issue. And I think a big part of it is because many of these countries have been somewhat co-opted by China because of the Belt and Road um, Initiative and because of, you know, large scale infrastructure projects. And I think it's also some, you know, not wanting to get involved in what they see as, I guess, a battle between, you know, superpowers of US um, and, and China. But at the same time, you know, this is something that, you know, is happening to, to their brothers and sisters. And, you know, I think we probably also need to do you know, a greater role in reaching out to civil society organizations, um, you know, particularly in a number of these countries to try and sort of raise, get them to, to raise more pressure um, on, on their governments. I think we, we still have some more questions, but, you know, unfortunately we are running out of time. So I guess, you know, there was just one um, last question here um, about whether you know, about what is actually fueling this anti-Muslim sentiment, you know, I guess around the world, you know, from, from Xinjiang to, to Myanmar to, to other places. Do you want to comment on, on that? Uh, I, you know, I don't think I'm qualified to talk about anti-Muslim movement around the world, but what's happening to Uyghur people is definitely not because we're Muslim only. And I'm extremely uh, uncomfortable with marginalizing Uyghur called Uyghur Muslim. When Christian get killed by somebody, we don't say, uh, you know, Jewish, uh, you know, people, or we don't mention their religion. We're not gonna say German Christians got killed or something. We just say German, we just say their name. But unfortunately, international media keep mentioning Uyghur Muslims. Here's, here's the thing, okay? We are under Chinese Communist Party for many years, for more than 60 years. And there are thousands of Uyghurs are atheists. They don't believe in God. That's the education they've been through. There are maybe a lots of Uyghur Christians. There are maybe, maybe Muslims, right? And also there, it's not only Uyghurs. People are not Chinese, number one. Number two, they're not aligned with Chinese Communist Party's values. These people are subject to going to Chinese concentration camp. Even if being Uyghur is more than enough, to get this treatment from Chinese Communist Party. We are getting this treatment from China because we are Uyghur, we're Kazakh, we're Kyrgyz. That's why they're putting us in the concentration camp. And this is not about our religion. China wanted to erase us. They said, this is final solution. Chinese government officials mentioned putting us in the, in the concentration camp as a final solution. I would give you an example. Many uh, scholars that is working for uh, you know, big universities, which there are uh, Chinese Communist Party members, they promoted Chinese Communist Party's ideologies for many years. They were taken to the Chinese concentration camp. We were police, the head of police department in Kashgar, he was taken to the concentration camp as well, even though he was working loyally for Chinese Communist Party. So this is not about Muslim, this is about us being prosecuted by Chinese Communist Party as Uyghur, that's our identity. Thanks, Kazad. I think that's actually a really powerful place to, to end this discussion. I think we could, we could keep talking probably for, for hours. Um, but I guess just to, to summarize and, and thank you for you know, your really incredible insights. Um, you know, I think some of the key points you know, that have come up again and again is you know, really the need for you know, not just diplomatic pressure, but also economic pressure um, on the Chinese government the need to address the forced labor issues through you know, stronger government measures, but also through pressure by consumers on the companies that are buying um, those products to, to clean up their supply chains. Um, and also the need for collective diplomatic action by all states um, and the need for governments to actually work together to, to draw attention to these issues. So you know, I think there's you know, certainly a lot more work to be done, but I really wanna commend you 
um, for for the work um, that you are doing, and you know certainly the the enormous sort of personal sacrifice and and toll that it it also clearly takes um, on you personally. I would really like to to thank. Um, the US Embassy for inviting us to, to this event and for inviting me to, to moderate it. Uh, Human Rights Watch Australia acts in association with Human Rights Watch Incorporated internationally. And this disclosure is made um, under the Commonwealth Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme of 2018. I would like to thank everyone who has taken the time out um, to join us for this event today. Thank you all so much for your questions. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. And I would really encourage you, you know, if you're interested in, in getting more information about this important topic, um, to look for Kuzat's work um, and also to look at the work for Human Right of Human Rights Watch, uh, specifically on these important issues um, affecting Uyghurs in China today. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for your time.